Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing supraventricular tachycardia. Now, there are lots of kinds of subtypes of supraventricular tachycardia. We're not going to get as much into those in this video. What we really want to do here is we're going to discuss the basic mechanism of supraventricular tachycardia, and we're going to look at what you might see on an EKG. Okay, so we'll come back to the EKG in a few minutes, but let's talk about the mechanism of supraventricular tachycardias. Now, as I mentioned, there are multiple kinds of supraventricular tachycardias, and actually atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation are two subtypes, but those are, are common enough to where we're going to be talking about those separately actually in the next video. All right, so in people with supraventricular tachycardia, the normal pacemaker is the SA node, and in fact, there's really no issue with the SA node. It's functioning normally. So where does the error occur? Well, the error is really at the AV node. And before we go into this, let's do a very, very brief review of the cardiac conduction system. So for most individuals, healthy individuals, including those with supraventricular tachycardias, sinoatrial node or SA node is the pacemaker of the heart. Okay, so the sinoatrial node has a few pathways that come off of it. One is Bachman, Bachman's bundle. This goes to uh, depolarize the, the uh, left atrium. And then there's a bunch here that kind of go throughout the right atrium. Okay, there's one here, there's one here, and there's one that's the most on the right side. Okay, all three of these depolarize the right atrium. Um, now, the ones... Now, the electrical signals that go to Bachmann's bundle to the left atrium, they just terminate there. All they do is depolarize the left atrium. Uh, but these ones here that go throughout the right atrium will converge at this structure, which is called the atrioventricular node, or AV node. Now, there's a few things about the AV node that you need to understand. One, um, it eventually leads to the His bundle, or AV bundle, or bundle of His, as it's called, which projects into the ventricles. And so, in order for the ventricles to contract, the AV node has to send impulses more distally through these pathways down here. So, when that happens, the ventricles contract. Okay, there's also what we call an AV delay. Okay, when electrical impulses come to the AV node, it doesn't just immediately send those impulses through the His bundle down to these bundle branches to the ventricles. Okay? There's a delay. Now, usually what you're taught in an anatomy course is that that delay is to allow sufficient time for the ventricles to fill with blood because they're in diastole. And so if they can fill with blood enough, then when they contract, they'll eject the maximum amount of blood. We don't want the ventricles contracting too early. So the AV node delays. And that's true. That is one purpose of the delay. The AV node has one other function. So you can see here that there's impulses coming from the SA node coming to the AV node from multiple places, right? And if all of those impulses were transmitted to the ventricles, the ventricles would be contracting way too fast. Why? Because there's, there would be way too many impulses coming to the AV node and going through. So one of the other jobs of the AV node is to selectively filter those impulses. And so maybe instead of 100% of them going through, it maybe allows half of that. Okay, I don't know the exact number, but the point is, is it acts as a gate, closes sometimes to prevent these impulses from going through, and then opens other times to allow them through. So that way less go through to the ventricles, because if all of them went through, the ventricles would be contracting extremely fast, greater than 150 beats a minute, and that's actually what we see in supraventricular tachycardia. So what happens if that mechanism fails? Well, let's talk about it. So here's what we have in a normal situation, okay? SA node is the pacemaker of the heart, and we have multiple impulses coming from the SA node to the AV node. Okay. Some of them are fast, some of them are slow. Now, the tendency is actually that the fast ones um, actually make it to the AV node, and then those are able to go through uh, to the ventricles, and they trigger ventricular depolarization and ventricular systole. Okay. Now, there's others that are slower. Okay. And these ones, 
they make it to the AV node, but they're sort of dissipated there, okay? That's part of the gating mechanism, okay? They're dissipated. And so these ones don't actually um, go through past the AV node, uh, and so you only have a limited number of impulses going from the AV node down through bundle of Hiss, the bundle branches, and the Purkinje fibers. And so the ventricles have a limited frequency of contraction, which is normal, and assuming it's normal sinus rhythm and not a bradycardia or tachycardia, it's going to be 60 to 100 beats a minute. Okay? Even if it was 120, if it was a sinus tachycardia, um, you can still have this mechanism functional. Okay? But what happens if that gating mechanism becomes impaired? Okay? Now we've got an issue. So here's our SA node again. We've got multiple pathways um, that are sending impulses to the AV node. Okay? The fast ones are still getting through. Uh, but look what's happening in the slow path. Instead of being dissipated by the gating mechanism, something is erroneous, and it's actually allowing these impulses to kind of loop around. And instead of being dissipated, they loop around and still end up going to the AV node and going through it. And so the frequency of impulses going to the ventricles is higher. And so therefore, the rate of depolarization and the rate of contraction is going to be higher. So we're going to see heart rates above 150 beats a minute. Now, this is one mechanism of supraventricular tachycardia. This is just one. In fact, this one is actually shown right here at the top in A. Okay, this is where um, you've got a fast pathway that's normal and then a slow pathway that normally should be dissipated, but it instead loops around um, and allows the uh, more impulses to go through the AV node to the ventricles. That's just one mechanism, though. Okay, there's other reasons that we can have this, um, and these are different conditions, but still classified as supraventricular tachycardias. But the big idea with these, and really with the impaired gating mechanism here, is that any one of these mechanisms is always going to send more impulses to the AV node. If the AV node gets more impulses through it, you're going to have a supraventricular tachycardia. Notice with the gating mechanism being impaired. Again, you have this looping around and more impulses going through the AV node. These ones over here do the same thing, but through a different mechanism. The first one's an accessory pathway. So it's not the gating mechanism that's a problem. Here, the gating mechanism's intact, but you've got these impulses going through the bundle branches, Purkinje fibers, but they're able to loop around somehow and go back through the AV node. And so that's going to produce more impulses going through the AV node. Down here, you have an extra pacemaker that's abnormal or something abnormal that's giving more um, depolarizations. And so it's sending those to the AV node. So again, the AV node is getting extra impulses going through it and they go through to the ventricles and give it a higher frequency of depolarization. Therefore, you have a supraventricular tachycardia. So anything that causes more impulses to go through the AV node um, than normal is going to produce a supraventricular tachycardia. So we've kind of already hit this. So in order to be supraventricular tachycardia, it has to be a heart rate greater than 150 beats a minute. Okay? Um, a normal sinus tachycardia as we talked about in the previous video, a tachycardia is going to be between 100 and 150. Okay? If it surpasses 150, it's most likely not a sinus tachycardia. It's supraventricular in nature. This one had a heart rate of 115. So that makes it a sinus tachycardia. In addition, it has a normal P wave, a normal QRS, and a normal T wave. One characteristic feature of supraventricular tachycardias is normally the P wave is not discernible. Okay? What you're actually going to see are a QRS complex and a T wave. Let's take a look at that. So notice we have a normal QRS complex right here, and then we have a T wave following it. Now, here's the question you might ask. How do you know if this is a T wave of the previous QRS or a P wave leading to the next QRS. How do you know, is it P or is it T? Well, technically it doesn't matter. The P wave is hidden under the T wave, and so it looks like one hump. The key with most supraventricular tachycardias is when you're looking at an EKG, if you just see one hump between the QRS complexes, you don't really need to worry about is it a T wave or is it a P wave? Is it a P wave hidden under a T wave? It's just one hump between the QRSs. As long as you have that pattern, one hump QRS, one hump QRS, one hump QRS, um, 
it doesn't matter. It's probably supraventricular tachycardia, especially if you've got the normal QRS complex. Also, um, generally the RR intervals are regular, but not necessarily, but generally they are regular. And so we can use that to calculate the heart rate to ensure that it is above 150 beats a minute. So we do the same thing as before. We, um, we make sure it's regular, and then we look for one of these peaks on a solid dark line. This is probably the best one over here on the right. Again, you don't have to do this, um, but it makes it a little bit easier to count the small boxes in between the two peaks. Okay, So here's five small boxes. Remember, these thicker lines are five and then six, seven, eight, nine, roughly. There's about nine small boxes between those two. And so to calculate the heart rate, same formula every time, 1,500 divided by nine. So 1,500 divided by the number of small boxes between the Rs, and you divide this out and you get 167 beats a minute. That is greater than 100, but it's also greater than 150. And so because of that, I should probably put it's greater than 150 here, it's a supraventricular tachycardia. Okay. Um, also, we can distinguish this from sinus tachycardia in another way. Not only is the heart rate bigger than 150, uh, but there's no discernible P wave, right? In sinus tachycardia, we had a discernible P wave, QRS and T. P, QRS, and T. In a supraventricular tachycardia, there's just one hump. Okay? And if you have that pattern coupled with a heart rate greater than 150, you can be pretty confident that it's a supraventricular tachycardia. So hopefully this video made sense, gave you a good understanding of the mechanism of a supraventricular tachycardia. And in the next video, we're going to go into atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation, which are in some ways kind of distinct, um, but they are subtypes of supraventricular tachycardias. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.